This last act of Richard III finds all of the characters heading toward a confrontation at Bosworth Field. Uh, this would be a significant battle, not because it was that much more violent and consequential than any of the others we've read about, but because of what it came to represent. Tudor chroniclers interpreted the battle as the end of the Middle Ages for England, and Henry of Richmond's subsequent rule as the dawning of what's known as the Modern Age. It also marked the end of the War of the Roses uh, and the civil strife that had been plaguing the country for almost a hundred years previously, but we'll talk more about that in a bit. Act 5 begins with the execution of Buckingham. Uh, his uprising has failed, and he, as he's led off to execution, uh, he seems to be very aware of the mistakes that he's made and of the poetic justice that he now faces. Um, he says... This is the day which in King Edward's time I wished might fall on me when I was found false to his children and his wife's allies. This is the day wherein I wished to fall by the false faith of him whom I most trusted. This, this all soul's day to my fearful soul is the determined respite of my wrongs. That high all-seer which I dallied with hath turned my feigned prayer on my head and given in earnest what I begged in jest. Thus doth he force the swords of wicked men to turn their own points in their master's bosoms. Thus Margaret's curse falls heavy on my neck. When he, quoth she, shall split thy heart with sorrow, remember Margaret was a prophetess. Come, lead me, officers, to the block of shame. Wrong hath but wrong, and blame the due of blame. So he's realized that he's dallied with God. It might be expected even required of a scheming nobleman to swear false oaths and lightly pledge to alliances that he doesn't really care about. But when they do it in God's name, uh, they shouldn't expect there to be no consequences for that. He also explicitly ties his fate back to Margaret's curse, as the Woodvilles and Hastings did before him. Now her curse has fallen on everyone in exactly the way that she said it would, uh, with the exception of Richard. We then meet Richmond for the first time and see how he behaves towards his generals and his friends. Uh, both they and Richard's army uh, make camp for the night with the expectation that they are going to be engaging in battle the next day. And this would be a particularly striking uh, scene to see represented on stage. Richard's tent would be on one end and Richmond's on the other. And seeing them both interacting with their troops and advisors at the same time, would serve to highlight the parallels between them. Both retire to bed and both have dreams. Uh, Richard's are troubled and Richmond's are peaceful. In Richard's dream, a, a long procession of those he's murdered uh, wander into his tent and confront him. Uh, we see characters from this play as well as characters from previous plays. Uh, Henry VI, his son, Edward, uh, King Edward, uh, Clarence, Queen Anne, Buckingham, uh, and many others. They all call to remembrance the crimes he committed on them, and then they all have the same message for him. Despair and die. Then, the ghosts travel across the stage to Richmond's tent and pour out blessings on his head. Uh, they all say, live and flourish, or some variation on that theme. Uh, no wonder that, they, that when they both wake up, Richard is troubled and Richmond says that he slept like a baby. And I think it's actually up to us as readers uh, to interpret whether these were visions of a dream or real ghosts of the departed looking to instill terror in the heart of the tyrant and courage into the heart of the tyrant's enemy. Uh, in either case, whatever you want to make of it, uh, it really shatters Richard's peace of mind uh, and makes him fear for the outcome of the next day's battle. He sits up in bed, covered in a cold sweat, and he starts talking to himself to shake off the terror of the dream. And uh, this is, it's such a great speech in that it depicts Richard's fragmented mind at the time. Uh, we see a man who's in real conflict with himself, uh, which is a natural result of the conflict we've seen depicted over the last three plays, uh, really over the last seven. Uh, these plays, as you know, have all been about civil war and internal divisions. Uh, we've seen kingdoms divided, families divided, and now, finally, we see the individual divided as well. Uh, he's, no longer to speaking, he's no longer speaking to us, the audience, in soliloquy, as he did earlier. 
Now he's speaking to himself in dialogue. He says, What do I fear? Myself? There's none else by. Richard loves Richard. That is, I am I. Is there a murderer here? No. Yes, I am. Then fly. What, for myself? Great reason why, lest I revenge. What, myself upon myself? Alack, I love myself. Wherefore, for any good that I myself have done to my, unto myself? Oh no, alas, I rather hate myself for hateful deeds committed by myself. I am a villain. Yet I lie, I am not. Fool, speak of, that, of thyself, speak well. Fool, do not flatter. My conscience hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in a several tale, and every tale condemns me for a villain. Perjury, perjury in the highest degree. Murder, stern murder in the direst degree. All several sins, all used in each degree, thronged to the bar, crying all, guilty, guilty. I shall despair. There is no creature loves me, and if I die, no soul will pity me. Nay, wherefore should they, since that I myself find in myself no pity to myself? Methought the souls of all that I had murdered came to my tent, and every one did threat tomorrow's vengeance on the head of Richard. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, throughout this reasoning, uh, it's as if Richard is able to take a hard look at himself for the first time uh, in his life. It's uh, similar to the moment back in Richard II when the king asked for a mirror uh, so that he could read his failings written in his face, if you remember that. This Richard doesn't have a mirror with him, uh, but he can honestly judge the sort of man he's become by the sort of feeling that he inspires in himself. Uh, he feels fear, and there's no reason to fear if there's not someone or something present that, they, that can cause harm. Uh, so the feeling he has uh, justifies the conclusion that there is someone present to fear, himself. Uh, that's the sort of logic that he takes there. He sees himself as a murderer, a liar, and a betrayer. Uh, he knows that he has no redeeming quality. It's why he says that if he dies, no soul would pity him, and they shouldn't. And this is a train of thought that might lead another man to repentance. Uh, the Bible talks about two kinds of sorrow, uh, one that works death and one that works repentance. Uh, both involve coming to the end of oneself, uh, seeing what a hopeless wreck one's made of their life, as Richard does here. And, we, we, and uh, we read in Scripture that godly sorrow works repentance, but the sorrow of the world works death. And the difference between the two is illustrated by Richard's speech. You'll notice that even in his moment of sorrow, uh, he's still only thinking about himself. He's thinking about no, how no one will pity him, how no one will mourn him when he's dead. And so he despairs. He still isn't giving much thought to his actual victims. Uh, he's just sorry that now he's in such a bad state. And it doesn't really take long for him to talk himself out of it either. Uh, he's had this pang of remorse or a pang of conscience here, but when morning comes, he hardens his heart again, almost right away. He says, Go, gentlemen, every man into his charge. Let not our babbling dreams affright our souls. Conscience is but a word that cowards use, devised at first to keep the strong in awe. Our strong arms be our conscience, swords our law. March on, join bravely, let us to it pell-mell, if not to heaven, then hand in hand to hell. Uh, so he's voicing a sentiment here that would later find fuller expression in the 19th century writers, uh, the existentialist philosophers, uh, such as uh, Friedrich Nietzsche who would argue that morality itself was something of a hoodwink, uh, an illusion put in place by the weak masses in order to keep would-be conquerors and heroes in check. And remember that uh, one of Clarence's killers talked about this checking power, or this uh, power of reigning in that conscience has. So when uh, Richard says this, uh, we can be assured that he's thoroughly quashed any qualms or thoughts of repentance that he may have briefly had. Um, he's felt this pang of conscience, but he's dismissed it as just a hoodwink, something that he shouldn't really merit or pay any attention to. And this is partly due to despair, uh, but also to, due to his uh, growing sense of courage. Oddly enough, the two emotions are existing side by side within him at this point. 
he is despairing uh, because he knows that he's gone too far to turn back. Uh, even if this isn't the ideal battlefield, uh, even if his allies aren't the most loyal or his troops the most trustworthy, he's going to have to play things through no matter what. He can't back out now. But because he's always been a soldier, a warrior, uh, one who lives for bloodletting in the battlefield, he gains courage the closer the time comes to actual combat. Uh, he spent months, uh, historically it would have been years, uh, on the defensive, uh, weeding out enemies, real or imaginary. Now, finally, he's back in his element. Uh, we get the impression that he's been missing this ever since his brother took the throne all those years ago. Uh, remember, it's what he was yearning for in the beginning of the play, uh, for a return to battle and alarms. He gets one more warning omen that things might not go well for him, uh, but he doesn't hearken to it. Uh, the sun doesn't rise. Now, the play doesn't make clear if it was just a cloudy morning or if there was an eclipse of some kind. Either way, this isn't good for someone who is fighting under the insignia of the sun. Uh, the sun has been associated with the House of York ever since Edward's time. Uh, you'll remember the story behind that. And even more so, it's been associated in these plays with the Plantagenet kings throughout. Uh, Henry V made that connection and referred to himself as the son, uh, as did Richard II. This Richard sees the veiling of the sun as sort of a neutral omen uh, to both himself and Richmond. But Richmond's not associated uh, with the sun in the way that the Plantagenets are. He's flying under the banners of the Red Dragon, uh, the insignia of the Welsh. He has some Plantagenet blood in him uh, from his mother's side, but his grandsires are a French queen and a Welsh nobleman. Richard is the last of the true Plantagenet bloodline, and after this battle, uh, for the first time in 300 years, a new family will be sitting on the throne. So uh, the eclipsing of the sun has much more significance for Richard uh, but again, he doesn't pay any heed to it. We have an interesting scene uh, where both Richard and Richmond give parallel speeches to their troops before the battle begins. And it's interesting to look at the sort of rhetoric that each uses. Uh, both are essentially making the same pitch. Uh, fight bravely, defend your families, uh, defend your homeland. But Richmond uh, does this by using comforting language. Uh, he draws in the minds of his troops uh, pictures of wives kept safe, um, the pictures of the country's future abundance, uh, children's repaying uh, the soldier's toil in their old age. All this if they triumph on the battlefield today. Richard's speech focuses, however, on the negative. He paints uh, bad images on what would happen uh, should his soldiers fail. So um, he imagines wives ravished, uh, daughters defiled, lands pillaged. And this is perfectly in keeping with uh, Richard's philosophy of ruling through fear rather than love. But the contrast also shows how Richard is really just sort of inescapably this creature of blood in wartime, while Richmond brings with him, almost as if he exudes it from his own person, uh, the promise of peace and security. So while one army is motivated by hope, the other is motivated by terror. And we can sort of see uh, which was the more powerful motivator by how the battle actually turns out. So Richard had divided his army into three main groups under Northumberland, Norfolk, and himself, uh, with Stanley basically waiting in the reserves. Uh, his army well outnumbered Richmond's, and there shouldn't have been any problem. Well, uh, once the fighting began, Norfolk's men were beaten back by Richmond's army and they just fled, uh, which isn't good. Uh, Northumberland didn't come to their rescue and he didn't respond to Richard's signals, uh, either because he was secretly hoping for Richmond's victory or because his men were scared too. And of course, Stanley just switched sides, as he was always planning to do. Seeing all this chaos around him, uh, Richard decided to end the battle as quickly as he could, and he led a charge of mounted men straight into the center of Richmond's forces, uh, going for Richmond himself. And this final charge uh, has been considered sort of the uh, swan song of medieval chivalry, and so it's appropriate that the plays we've been reading uh, culminate in this moment. There were some uh, individual acts of bravery worthy of note, 
Uh, Norfolk, even though his men ran away, he didn't. He fought and he was slain. Uh, Ratcliffe uh, died fighting alongside the king. And the king's standard bearer, uh, Sir Percival Thurwall, uh, displayed some gallantry that I think is worthy of remembrance. Uh, it's said that he held the standard aloft even after losing his legs, and he never let the banner fall until his uh, last breath. So I think that's just kind of a cool story that um, is worth making note of. And uh, Richard acquits himself well on the battlefield too. Uh, others in the play are amazed, and they talk about how he's in acting wonders more than a man, almost as if he's a superman. Uh, Richmond, on the other hand, is almost purposely uh, trying to blend in. So we have a superman and a sort of a chameleon. Uh, Richmond's pulling a trick out of Henry IV's playbook, actually, and he has decoys in the field. Uh, Richard's complaining that he thinks he's already killed five of them uh, before he finds the actual Richmond. And the last time we see him, uh, his horse has been slain from underneath him, and he's so wrapped up in the battle that he's shouting that he'll trade his kingdom for a fresh horse, uh, which is kind of surprising given how much we know that he valued the crown. And this might be the first time in a long while that the throne and the crown actually aren't on his mind. Uh, winning is the only thing on his mind. But he sees Catesby, and he says this when Catesby tries to lead him to safety. Slave, I have set my life upon a cast, and I will stand the hazard of the die. I think there be six Richmonds in the field. Five have I slain today instead of him. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. And then he keeps uh, running around looking for Richmond, killing whoever gets in his way. Uh, so again, uh, when he's talking about uh, setting his life upon the die's cast, uh, he sees his fate as already in some sense determined. Uh, he's already cast that die, and now all that's left is to endure the results and see if he uh, has a good result or a bad one. He finally confronts Richmond, the real Richmond, and they fight, and Richard is slain. And with this act, Margaret's curse can be considered uh, put to rest. Because for so long, we've seen this cycle of violence playing itself out over and over again. And every criminal and rebel uh, that we've read about has had at least a semi-legitimate reason for the evils that they're committing, uh, because somebody else had previously committed the same evils on them or on their fathers. Uh, that's why it's so hard to put feuds to rest because one side's justice is always another side's incitement to revenge. But because Richard killed everyone, uh, he quashed multiple feuds by assassinating all the participants, uh, Lancasters, Woodvilles, and Yorks, all of the guilt, all of the blame, was resting on his shoulders. Now that he's killed, there's a fresh start in a way that there hasn't been before. No one has uh, any cause to complain of past wrongs because all the past wrongs have been brought to justice through either Richard's own actions or through Richard's death. He's almost a sort of scapegoat for the sins of the War of the Roses. And in his closing speech, Richmond recognizes this. He talks about how the houses of York and Lancaster are finally going to be reconciled, uh, how civil wars will finally be put to rest. And in this speech, he echoes a lot of the language that the Bishop of Carlisle made in his prophecy back in Richard II about what would happen should Bolingbroke usurp the throne. And that speech uh, by the bishops was uh, looking forward uh, to what was to come. And Richmond's is looking backward and saying, yes, that did happen, but now we're moving forward. Uh, he says, We will unite the white rose and the red. Smile, heaven, upon this fair conjunction that long have frowned upon their enmity. What traitor hears me and says not amen? England hath long been mad and scared herself. The brother blindly shed the, blood, the brother's blood. The father rashly slaughtered his own son. The son compelled been butcher to the sire. All this divided York and Lancaster, divided in their dire division, Oh, now, let Richmond and Elizabeth, the true succeeders of each royal house, by God's fair ordinance, conjoin together. And let their heirs, God, if thy will be so, enrich the time to come with smooth-faced peace, with smiling plenty and fair prosperous days. Abate the edge of traitors, gracious Lord, that would reduce these bloody days again and make poor England weep in streams of blood. 
Let them not live to taste this land's increase that would with treason wound this fair land's peace. Now civil wounds are stopped, peace lives again, that she may long live here, God say, Amen.